G'day viewers, Jason, Joondal Up Electrical Services. Well, it's uh, it's winter here in Perth, West Australia. Uh, starting to get a bit of rain. Paddocks are wet, they're going nice and green. See in the background there. But uh, typically winter brings two types of problems for uh, a solar installer, retailer. Um, one is uh, earth isolation issues on solar systems. <coughs> oh, sorry, that camera was way too close. Um, earth isolation issues on solar systems. Uh, what that means is where the inverter is shut down and there's an alarm, usually a code. On SMA, it'll be a 3501. Um, and... Um, the other issue that we typically see in winter with off-grid systems is state of charge drift where you might have an off-grid system that's saying it's got 70% of charge. I don't know why 70% seems to be the, the magic number. But the system will actually shut down um, and that's because it's got state of charge drift and that usually happens on off-grid systems where there is no generator or the generator is out of fuel or it's uh, switched off, um, that sort of thing. And so the batteries need a good top up because they haven't been had an equalised charge for some time and so they, they uh, drift out of calibration and the system shuts down when there is a load put on it. Uh, I've got that problem with a Red Earth Black Max at the moment with a day inverter in it, um, which was not commissioned by me. It was set up by Red Earth themselves, and that one has become a bit of a thorn in my side. So I'm trying to sort that out. Um, incidentally, that's not something I typically do. I will usually build my own systems for that very reason uh, so that I've got control of it and I know what's happening and it's all been set up properly. Um, the earth isolation issues, unfortunately one of my own systems has got such a fault. It's about a five year old system, it's got an SMA tri-power inverter and LG panels. So a bit worried about that one. Um, the old tri-power TL-20s, I think they were, um, they typically had a problem with 3501 error codes, um, but it wasn't actually an earth isolation or an earth fault on the roof, on the PV array, it was an internal error on the inverter itself. This is a new generation AV40, I think it is, um, tri-power, SMO tri-power. And I've not seen this fault on that model inverter before. So I'm really hoping it's not the solar panels. Uh, if it is a problem up on the roof, hopefully it's just a pinched cable or something like that. I didn't actually install those solar panels. I did subcontract that out back in the day when I was dabbling with subcontracting and quickly learnt it. Uh, can have its own problems, such as exactly what I've got now. Um, so I did use one guy for a while subcontracting to me. I've had to go back to fix water leaks and now I've got this uh, this problem. So possibly a pinched cable, possibly water getting in a rooftop isolator, possibly a failed LG panel. I'm on my way there and uh, we'll go and check it out. So I'm at site now. This is my inverter. It's the Sunny Tri-Power. That's the model there. I've done my tests. I've done some insulation testing. I've done some voltage testings between the strings and to earth. Um, the owner's got to go out right now and the uh, rain's about to come back down again. So I'm gonna go elsewhere and share with you what I found. Okay, so I've pulled up down the road, uh, out of the rain. The rain's starting to come down now. I'm just actually down at Burns Beach, nice little spot in Perth's northern suburbs. Um, now this is probably something I should do on a whiteboard and a little bit more professional like a lot of the other more polished YouTube videos, but I'm a tradie, so deal with it. This is what my process is for testing for an earth isolation or insulation fault, same, same, um, or could be called a ground fault also. 
anyway, so once we get to site, what I will do is I will remove the DC inputs from the PV arrays into the inverter and I will test the earth insulation of each array using a 1000 volt tester. I actually only use a 500 volt tester and I've gotten by just fine with that. It will still give you an indication as to what's going on. But the standard measurements that we use as guidance within our textbooks and so forth is done using a 1000 volt tester. Now, when I first started doing solar, this kind of freaked me out that you could put a 1000 volts down uh, the PV array um, MC4s down the, down the positive and negative. But if you look on the type label at the back of a solar panel, you'll see that they're rated to typically above a thousand volts. And I thought it would damage the electronics and so forth. I'm not, I'm not actually that smart. I don't understand a lot of electronics and stuff like that, but um, I thought it would damage a lot of the electronics and that, and no, it doesn't. You can do it. So uh, a 1,000 volt tester, insulation tester, is also known as the old school, uh, what we used to call a mega. I don't know if they're still called a mega, but that's what we used to call them. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to have the positive and the negative for each string or just one string if indeed there is only one string and I'm going to test the earth insulation from positive to earth so find an earth point you can use the inverter if you want just the frame of the inverter if it's got the AC plug connected or you can find another earth reference and you're going to measure the negative to earth all right now they should be oh I'm not sure let me check Okay, I'm back. Had to refer to my notes. Sorry, there are thousands of notes in my phone. Well, not thousands, lots of notes in my phone on uh, solar and testing and so forth and fault codes and commissioning procedures and all sorts of stuff. Um, my memory's not that great, so it's important that I write everything down. So in my phone, and this actually doesn't sound right, but I've got one mega ohm as industry standard being acceptable. Now, bear in mind that's on a thousand volt tester. However, I've also got that over 200 mega ohm is, is best. That's what it should be up around. Um, but some inverters will fault on as low as 40 mega ohms. It depends on the inverter. Um, it also depends on the voltage of the string because that's ultimately what's going to push that uh, current through the point of failure. Um, okay. Okay, so I tested positive to earth and negative to earth. I think I had about 15 mega ohms on my 500 volt tester. So that's really quite low, to be honest. Um, so once I did that, I then tested my voltages to earth. So I used my multimeter on DC. And guys, just make sure that you use a multimeter that can handle the voltage you're about to put through it. Um, some uh, solar strings now can be up around a thousand volts so obviously make sure and commercial higher even still so make sure you're using the right tool because you don't want it to blow up in your hands um, so measure voltage to earth positive to earth I actually had 440 volts now typically when you do that test you'll get 30 40 volts but you'll actually quickly see it's dropping um, I don't completely understand why it does that, but I believe it must be some kind of capacitor effect between the cabling um, and earth, something like that. But normally you'll see it dropping, but I had a constant 440 volts from positive to earth. Uh, negative to earth, I didn't actually have anything significant, I don't think. Um, and then what I did is I measured my open circuit voltage of the array, so VOC. And the VOC of the array I was testing was 540 volts. So there's about a four, uh, well, there is a 100 volt difference between uh, those two. Um, so straight away, I know I've got a, a um, an insulation resistance fault because I should not have anywhere near that uh, voltage when measuring positive to earth on the um, PV string. So this is where a bit of maths comes into it. And this kind of blows my mind a bit because I'm not that great at maths, but uh, here it is. And hopefully I can explain it well enough for you that you can understand it. If you don't understand it, 
just do a Google search on fault finding on PV arrays and you'll find the same information, perhaps in a better format that you'll understand better. Um, but hopefully I don't miss anything out and I explain it properly. Okay, so my VOC was 540 volts, okay? Now I've got 14 panels in that string. So if I divide 540 by my 14 panels, that tells me that each panel is making 38.57 volts, okay? I measured from positive to earth 440 volts. Now divide that by what each solar panel is making gives me 11.4 panels, okay? Now, that straight away tells me that it's most likely not a pinched cable or something like that. Could not, could always be wrong. It's electricity after, after all it. It does some pretty crazy stuff. But typically that's going to tell me that that is a fault with the panel. Now the reason I say that is, let's say for example I measured 385 volts. when I was testing positive to earth. If I measured 385 volts, that's actually telling me that my fault is right here between the positive and this point here because that's my 10 panels there. And if I put my multimeter across there and I measure 385 volts, that's 10 times 38.57. So that is where my damaged cable is going to be. Now it's possibly a cable that's been um, caught under a solar panel when it's been clamped down and it's created that fault. Um, it could be a whole number of things. I've seen it before where it's been a fly cable pinched behind a earth lug where the earth lug goes in the rail. Uh, a lot of us slide the fly cable behind that earth lug and sometimes as you tighten it up, you actually damage the insulation on that cable. So, if that were the case, I could be reasonably confident that my fault would be there. And obviously different maths would apply um, if uh, I had, you know, different measurements. Uh, you just have to times it by the number of panels. It's some pretty basic maths, um, so that should work. So anyway, in my instance, I didn't have a clean 385 volts. I had 440. So that told me that my issue is around here somewhere and going to be on a panel because I haven't got that clean divided number into the 440. Um, so I went up, I had a look, I had another visual look of the panel which I thought was the problem and I couldn't visually see anything, but I removed that panel and I bypassed it. So I just took the positive from this panel, bypassed that one, went straight to that panel. And straight away I measured, uh, when I went from my positive to earth, I got 25 volts. Now, Obviously, that's telling me that I could have another problem on this panel over here because, again, it's not a full 38 volts, which each panel is putting out. It's somewhere in between. Um, now, again, this is all... It's electricity. It does weird things, but this is a, a basic method for fault finding. Now, the panels in question are LG 360s. Um, I think it was NIC or N1C. So I'm gonna go and do a little bit of research on that model panel now and see if they typically have internal errors. Uh, I Once I removed that panel, I was actually able to reconnect that string and my inverter started back up and it uh, reconnected and was functioning. So that tells me, oh, and also I redid my uh, insulation test positive to earth and that came up to about I think it was 54 mega ohms so that was a huge improvement so clearly that panel I removed had problems 
and if it wasn't that panel it could have possibly be the cabling around that panel um, that was a problem however like I say all my cabling looked fine and the maths is leading to an internal error on a solar panel but visually there's nothing clear so it's a little bit open-ended at the moment no doubt there'll be a part two on this video um, again this is one of my own systems LG do have a history of some panel failures water ingress uh, which is the likely situation here um, so I'll do a little bit of homework on that that one doesn't ring a bell to me as to being a problem but I may well have forgotten because my memory's not that great um, yes LG have left the market in Australia but with a push they are still warranting um, honoring warranty claims on their solar panels well at least the last time I made one on behalf of a system that wasn't my installation they did and uh, that was about two years ago so there we go some basic fault finding on a solar array I will do a part two and a conclusive video as to what I found it's raining now um, we may see that fault reoccur I don't think so but if it's a slow degradation of the panels then it may well be an ongoing problem over the years that's why I want to do a little bit of research on that model panel and um, find out if they are susceptible to problems because if they are I don't want to be going back every year every couple of years to replace individual panels I'd rather just uh, well replace the whole lot and that's going to be an issue in itself I don't know if LG will replace the whole lot or if they'll only replace individual modules despite knowing that there's a common problem with a particular model if indeed there is that's a tricky one that I'm going to have to deal with LG the flip side to this and the craziness of the whole STC claiming thing and I'm digressing a little bit as I always do I could pull all those solar panels off the roof put a new inverter on there and claim the STCs against that property again even though those panels have already only been up there for five years and I've already claimed STCs against them uh, reducing, uh, producing renewable energy for what it would have been I think 10 years at the time and clearly they're only halfway through it so but that's the craziness of this uh, program that we're operating under in Australia all right part two will follow cheers guys